All right. Welcome, special guest, Jonah Sullivan. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Brett. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I've been uh, looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I appreciate this. Now, you, you told me you've just been a little bit of a world traveler. You've been kind of all over the place with your with your soccer team. Where, where have you been? Yeah, I was in I was in Spain for 10 days in Madrid and then sort of just south of Barcelona. Wow. And then uh, our trip home got uh, the inevitable delay. So we made it to Amsterdam and then spent the night there and finally uh, made it back after I think it was a, only a 49 hour trip home from when we left <laughs> Barcelona to when I got home last night. But wow. uh, yeah, wow. all good. Now we do have another connection. You told me uh, a good friend of mine, ex teammate of mine, Scott Tucker, who swam at Auburn. Uh, he, he was one of the team captains actually my freshman year and an Olympian. Uh, you know, you're saying his son plays on your team. Yeah, his son. His son plays uh, my team. Goes to high school with my son. Um, and so, yeah, I've been coaching his son for a couple of years here as well. And it was funny. The first, you know, I, I talked with Scott about the work I do, and he had mentioned probably two years ago. He's like, "Oh, you know, you, you need to try to get on, you know, Brett's podcast, and <laughs> also you should have him on yours too." So uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll have to return the favor here someday soon. Well, this can just be a discussion, you know, we can knock a lot out today. And yeah, I um, love it. In terms of what you do, um, you know, a, a big part of what you do is is called Changing the Game Project. And for those that don't know, I can do a lot of research on it. And there's, there's so much information on the web about it. And you do brilliant work. But it all came about uh, from this kind of notion of uh, parents and uh the, the whole soccer fiasco of like I've been on the soccer field with with my kids by the way I've got I got mm -hmm. twin girls and and uh, my kids grew up playing soccer so I've seen soccer parents but um, you kind of had uh, a moment back in, around what 2012 was it yeah so you know I'd been coaching forever um, when I stopped playing uh, I got into coaching I mm -hmm. was coaching as a college assistant coach and then and then I met my wife and uh moved for her job and started doing the youth coaching thing and so i'd done that a long time but then you know as my kids sort of hit that age of um you know when they started playing and i started viewing it viewing from the sidelines as a parent not yeah. just as a coach i all of a sudden i was like wow this is like what what do i want what's the environment i want mm -hmm. for my own children in mm -hmm. sport and i didn't care if they played soccer i mean to be honest i you know, I'd, I'd seen enough youth soccer games, but right. they both like that. And that's what a lot of kids start out with. And I was just thinking, you know, when I was running organizations, I was always looking for tools to give to parents um, to help them just navigate. Right. Because as a coach of a youth coach, you get you know, you see how the journey ends in lots of different ways. And mm -hmm. this style leads to this and this leads to this. And you see great right. players who burn out and, you know other kids who everyone overlooks for years and then all of a sudden they come on late in their yep. career. And, um, and so I said, ah, you know, I, I wish there was better tools. And then when I wasn't f finding them easily, I said, well, maybe I'll just build it myself. And so I, I wrote this first book called change the game, which was really for parents to help create the right mindset for their kids. And, um, and then I realized that it's actually not super hard to write a book. It's really hard to sell a book. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was like, uh, so, so I had to, you know, start a blog around it and it led to um, a Ted talk and then wow. sort of a lot of speaking and things like that. And as we mentioned, you know, a second book in 2019 for coaches, because I was going in, I was talking to parents and they're like, Hey, this is great. Is anyone talking to the coaches? Right. Because we all have to work together, like athletes, coaches, parents, it's a three legged stool. And if you ignore one of the legs, the stool falls down. So when you when you start this project, when you start the book, and then obviously it turns into something bigger and, and better beyond just the book itself, um, where was the need? Well, where were we going wrong in the beginning? Like, you know, when you're sitting on the sidelines for the first time and looking at it from a parent's perspective, were you wondering to yourself, where did this all go wrong? Well, I was I was wondering to myself, right? I mean, my my sort of aha moment was I think my daughter was six, and it was a great six year old soccer game with the blob of players and mm -hmm. everyone falls <laughs> all over each other and can score yeah. in both goals, and everyone's equally excited. And <laughs> you know, next door is a air quotes competitive ten year old game, right? And it's yeah. competitive because the adults are competing harder, not the kids. And I was just thinking, mm. wow, was anyone? 
on my field looking there and looking at everyone yelling at the 12 year old referee yeah. and screaming yeah. at the kids and going, yeah. wow, that's what we hope for in four years. And, <laughs> and, and, and don't you wish, because I mean, so many parents, right. They, they don't realize they're on the wrong path until their kid quits and they're totally yeah. oblivious to the fact that their kid was burned out mm -hmm. or their child gets hurt and says, I'm done. Or the doctor says he's done or she's done. And they go, oh, that's what you were talking about. Right. So I wanted people to sort of, you know, that, you know, I just, I mean, our sort of tagline is like, you know, put a little more play back and play ball, put a, li a little more play back and playing sports. And I think we've yeah. lost this idea that, right, sports should be both competitive and fun. Like it's supposed to be enjoyable, or why would sure. you do it? And yeah. so, yeah, so that's kind of been our mission is just don't be afraid. To make it enjoyable don't be afraid to put you know you, that, that you're really the purpose of sport is human development through a sport and if your kid happens to have the genetics and the work ethic and all the internal characteristics and that little bit of luck needed to be very good well then great but um you know so many kids never get to that point because they quit yeah so who, who's your primary targets now then you think like your your audience that you're after is is it the education of the parents is that what you're after well in in the writing we with the blog we do a lot for parents with the way of champions podcast we do a lot for coaches right because yeah. i think right a, a coach influences 10 20 40 families a season right, right. hundreds in their lifetime mm -hmm. um whereas the parent influences their child or their children so we, we spend a lot of time focusing on coaches now and and looking at sort of this idea of, you know, coaching is not about X's and O's. And we interview some of the best coaches in the world mm -hmm. um, across so many sports. And the best ones talk about coaching is a relationship business. It's not an X's and O's business. It's if you can spell Google, you can get all the practice plans you want. Yeah. But the great coaches are ones who build relationships and build trust with families and with athletes and get them to a new place. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's true. I, I saw, I was looking at your podcast. Uh, I saw you're at episode 318. This one we're doing right here for me will be uh 310. So yeah, congrats, uh, we're, man. We're pretty close. We're getting that's there. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I've never, yeah. I've never managed to do, I mean, we've, we've managed to release one every week here for, that long however many wow. years that is and so that's been pretty cool um pretty cool project to just every week get more stuff out there get more stuff out there and and you know not every week speaks to everyone but mm -hmm. everyone has finds different different favorites and that's awesome yeah yeah no it's it's important the education and it's so good these days that we have information at our fingertips there are so many people doing incredible things and and sharing that information and and uh you know so if you want to find basically about anything about a anybody you can you can get in there and find it these days and and i love sitting there and pick, picking the best coaches in the world i love picking their brains and the best athletes and just figuring out what they're doing how they're doing it and uh, it's just constantly learning and evolving and growing but um but yeah, I think I I did experience something similar in in the soccer world um is there are, there are there places where it's more prevalent? Like when I did go to the soccer field, the the parents did seem really involved for for whatever reason. Like they they were allowed to shout at the referee. They were allowed to scream down there and do those sorts of things. Is there is it because that um, you know in those governing bodies or whatever it is where we're allowing those situations to kind of develop? Like we don't see that in swimming. We don't see parents screaming at kids from or, or screaming at, at at coaches from the side of the pool like it just doesn't happen in swimming so why is it happening in in soccer let's say i mean can i ask you i mean is it do you think part of it is maybe that swimming's a little bit more objective like your time is your time right whereas soccer is my kids definitely better than you know john's better than brett or brett's better yeah. than john yeah. because i think so um, and our private coach told us so, so therefore she is, or he is right. Whereas it's like, you know, if you're running track or if you're swimming, there's your time, right? It's hard to argue with your time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it could be part of it. I, I know that we we live in a, a society now where we want to shift blame for whatever the results are, right? Like we never want that person to to take 100% of the blame. And when I was an athlete growing up, I felt, John, I don't know, I don't know uh, what it was like for you or what you've experienced with your team, let's say, but I always tried to look at myself first. I always felt like I had the most growth in my athletic career when I did a self-assessment, you know, first of all, of like, all right, well, what am I doing? Like, what, what could I do better? All right. Like, mm-hmm. that's where I was always at as an athlete. And I always appreciated the fact that my parents allowed me to do that first. Like, my, my parents never came in and said, this is the coach isn't doing this and this is what you're not doing this is the, they always allow me to get into the car have a moment of silence where however long that moment was and just allow me to sit in that for a minute and mm. and i always appreciated my parents for that maybe i haven't even told them how much i appreciate that and how much it probably helped my growth but they just allowed me to kind of sit there and figure it out first of all and then i would then they would start, you know, my dad especially would start to poke and ask some questions or, you know, say a few comments here and there, which would then kind of create some discussion around all right, what went wrong, what could have been better, these those sorts of things, or what went right, you know, that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think I think my parents just allowed me that space, which was always really nice, you know? Yeah. And I think that's one of the huge things that I wrote about in my first book, which is was ownership, right? That mm-hmm. the the child owns the the activity it's theirs and and not just the child the college athlete the pro athlete it's it's got to yeah. belong to them um yeah. because ownership and enjoyment breed intrinsic motivation mm-hmm. right and you talk about self-awareness and i mean this is it as well self-awareness for an athlete is key self-awareness for a coach is key and um you know i was maybe much like you in that my parents were great about um sort of not ever making excuses when i didn't do well right they didn't blame the coach whatever i I remember like i was a late bloomer right i didn't really Mm. grow until i was about 16 Mm -hmm. and so you know i was always playing against people who were bigger faster stronger than me and i remember my dad saying to me you know that kid's a man now he's not getting any bigger and and, and you're going to grow a lot Right. He said, so you don't control that, but what do you control? Like, mm-hmm. what do you own in this moment? You own your fitness, you own your attitude, you own your effort, you own your skill development. Like do work, do all the things that you control. Um, and if, you, and if you, you know, cause I remember I went home and I was, you know, complaining about not playing. And that was, my dad said, you want me to go to your coach? He goes, well, have you done everything that you can possibly do? Right. Are you telling me you're the fittest you've ever been and you've been yep. the best teammate you've ever been yep. and you pick up the balls and you show up early and you stay late? Are you doing all those things? Because if you are, then maybe I'll talk to your coach. But right. if you're not, well, then there's a lot for you to do before I should get involved. And I always appreciated mm-hmm. that. And I, yeah. Because now as pa- parents, right, we love our kids. We want to, we, you know, and it's our natural instinct to protect them. Yet sport is this great place for them to struggle and, yeah. and, 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 and grow and, and suffer a little bit when things aren't going their way. And if we are always intervening, if we're always jumping in, if we're always trying to fix it for them, then, you know, the true benefits of sport really never happen. How, what are you hearing? What do you, um, what kind of feedback are you getting from coaches, especially NCAA coaches these days about, the transfer portal, right? Like mm. I, I left coaching in 2018, right before this thing came out, it was right around that time. But all I'm hearing these days is that, you know, kids are just entering this transfer portal and, and they're just shifting and going and there's no loyalty anymore. And, and, and what are you hearing from coaches in terms of this and what it's doing for sport? I mean, I don't think there's ever been a more challenging time to be an NCA coach, mm. uh, not just NCA, right? Any, you know, let's call it collegiate coach now because mm. of things like the transfer portal. I think number two, and maybe you saw this near the end of your time is this shift from students at a university, from being students who are asked to do rigorous work and challenged mm. to mm. customers 
to be catered to and served. And if the customer is uncomfortable, well, we have to fix it for the customer, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, right, that if you're going to get the most out of an athlete, they have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. They have to have days where they get out of the pool or get walk off the field. And man, that was hard. Like, I don't want it. And, And so what we have is this sort of combination of, I think, a generation of kids that have had everything quickly and an attitude in universities that you are the customer. Um, and, and if, if it's too hard, Mm. then we have to fix it for you. Right. Right. And so what happens, you know, for the coach who then pushes and says, not good enough, do it more. There's that push back. And so one, that athlete transfers, I don't want to fight for my spot. Right. I, I want to be here. And, and I think the idea behind the transfer portal was a good one. Mm. Like, you know, you, you, sh- you know, that, you know, you, you should have the opportunity to leave, but it seems to me that it shouldn't just be right. You, you know, I think a lot of people come in and already have one foot out the door. Right. Yeah. And if this is anything challenging or difficult, I'm going to leave. And so, you know, I, I, I think that's a, a terrible thing. I mean, we just had a, a great talk at, on the podcast with um, Sherry Cole, who was the Oklahoma women's basketball coach and just retired. And, mm-hmm. and, and we talked about this idea of, you know, if you're going to treat your student athletes like customers, you'll never yeah. get the most out of them. Yeah. Well, what, what's the answer then? Like, how do we, I mean, it's, it scares me because a couple of things scare me in the fact that I feel like a lot of the coaches too are very isolated in this. They can't collectively or they're not collectively talking about it. You know, I, when I left coaching, I had more coaches reach out to me and want to have conversations with me uh, 10 times more than I did when I was actually in coaching. It felt mm-hmm. like it felt like everybody was afraid to say what the obvious thing was because you're all out recruiting against each other as well. It's like you want to put up this great image of how how incredible my program mm-hmm. is. And then so as soon as I got out of it and I didn't have a skin in the game, I had all these coaches reaching out to me and saying, I'm experiencing that, I'm experiencing this. It was just like... And so that I didn't feel like there was there's no collective voice for the coaches anymore either, where, you know, we, we talk about all sorts of different issues with the athletes, but we're avoiding a lot of the, the, the challenges that the coaches have to face collectively, you know? I mean, amen. I think this is a huge, huge thing. We talk mm. about athlete mental wellness right, right. and things like that, which is incredibly important, right? right? But well, yeah, where are the supports for those coaches? And mm-hmm. and let's face it, right a- outside of football and, and and basketball, I mean, if you're a you know a big time NCA football coach, and you get fired, you got a five, eight, ten million dollar yeah umbrella, right? If you're coaching an Olympic sport and you get mm-hmm. fired, you mm-hmm. don't have that. You're mm-hmm. you're out, right? And so many of them work on one year rolling contracts, and yeah. it's easier to fire a coach than stand up for a coach against a student athlete or, yep. or a parent who's threatening a lawsuit or whatever. Yep. And so they just get rid of the coach. And I mean, I know so many coaches now that they will not have a meeting without someone else there and oftentimes oh, yeah. record recording it too. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Recording it. They record yep. everything. And so we, we we're putting all these barriers to the personal relationships that are required to truly coach and change lives. Um, because we're so afraid of getting sued, so yeah. afraid of getting fired. And it's it's a really scary, scary thing for a lot of coaches. I mean, I'm 51. My advice to 23-year-old getting into coaching, be really thoughtful about going into college coaching because I don't know what the future <laughs> holds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I give the same advice too. People call me up all the time like, I really want this job. I want to get for that. I want to get in college coach. I'm like, have you thought about this? You know, yeah. like, uh, so I try and give that, that type of advice too. But um, yeah, it's definitely, definitely um, in, an interesting period of time where all, all this is shifting. So, you know, the reason for you starting, you know, changing the game project and, and then where it is today, how, how has it progressed for you and, and where, where has the success been along the, um, along the journey for you in this? I mean, you know, people ask me 
still today, well, you know, what's your six month plan? And I'm like, if I ever came up with a six month plan in the last 10 years, it would have been wrong. So, you know, I had no idea where it would go. And it's progressed from, you know, one book to a third one coming out. And it's progressed from, um, you know, just talking to parents and then doing work with parents and coaches and boards. And then now, uh, add in, um, I do a lot of team development work, uh, mm. in the college space as well. So I have about six teams that I work with right. across a whole bunch of different sports, but realistically, you know, kind of to get back to one of your previous points, what I spend a lot of my time doing is just as a sounding board mm -hmm. for coaches, right? Mm -hmm. A neutral voice who understands coaching, who understands teams, yeah. who understands culture to bounce ideas off of because I can't call my competitor. And, you know, some, some university athletic departments are amazing open workspaces where you can go into the office of any coach and seek advice, things like that. And others, you know, God forbid you step on the basketball court or you can't get an appointment with the football coach or something like that, even though that's supposedly your peer. Um, and so there's no place to turn. So um, it's just, I think, nice for them to call up and be like, hey, can I vent for 10 minutes and then yeah. I'm good to go? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I think that's what you're doing now, too. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of that. <laughs> Definitely experienced a lot of that. Um, you said you got a new book coming out. What, what's the new book about? Yeah. So Jerry Lynch, my partner on the podcast and our coaching conference and stuff, uh, and I decided to do a book together because we, you know, we had these books on coaching and we had books on parent for parents and but you know we work with these teams and like well how, how do you become a great teammate right and so we have this book coming out in may of 2023 called the champion teammate and mm. timeless lessons to connect compete and lead in sports and life right and so you're going to be part of teams your whole life right whether it's your work team your church your community your family right um and we always tell people be a great teammate, but we don't teach them how to do it. And mm -hmm. so Jerry and I put together this book. It's it's short, sweet, two, three page chapters, stories of athletes, coaches, teams we've worked with around all these areas um, around how do we connect? Right. How do you build relationships? Um, how do you create a more competitive, challenging environment? And then if you're asked to lead and we're all asked to lead at some point. Right. How do you become a better leader that that serves others and and um, you know gets your team to play for you and you play for them? So uh, it was a really fun project and uh, we wrote it pretty quickly um, because we were both you know it just poured out of us. It's something we'd been talking about for a while and like oh this this is this is the book that our teams need and hopefully a lot of others too as well. <laughs> What what about this? You're you're still coaching and and still doing all this at the same time and still being a sounding board for other coaches. So you you hear a lot, but you're also in it as well and and observing and experiencing. So I don't know how people coach these days in regards to communication with athletes, right? Like all the all the athletes communicate over social media and text. They don't really have one on one conversations as much anymore. So how how are, are teams now shifting and coaches adapting to this type of communication that goes on with athletes? Well, I think one of the great things, most important things we can do as a coach these days is, is teach today's kids and young adults to have difficult conversations in person, right? Like it's so easy to just send a text and break up with your girlfriend or, yeah, you know, I mean, I've watched kids start dating and break up without actually seeing the person face to face. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I, I think that's a, a huge piece. And I think, <clears throat> you know, having your team create standards around, you know, devices and, and when they're appropriate and, and when they're not. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool when we were in Spain, just the place we were training, our kids all kind of stayed together in this hostel and they had a rule, no phones at the table for mm -hmm. any meal. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And no phones in your room. So you had to plug them in downstairs at night, oh, wow. which was great. Wow. Um, and so, you know, it's funny because like here, here are these kids are and it's like they finish a meal and they all jump on their phone and, and 
They're not doing anything important. They're just scrolling through their own life. And yet here you are in Spain, right, with a beach a block and a half away. And you have this amazing opportunity to connect and talk and do things. And yet you want to be on your own scrolling reality or whatever. And it's just yeah. it's hard. I mean, we've we've handed children perhaps the most addictive substance of all time when their brains are not ready to deal with it. Even adult brains can't deal with it. And so I think as coaches creating device free moments and giving kids the excuse to be off their devices is something that I've sometimes found they actually appreciate to be able to say, Oh, my coach is a jerk. He won't let me have my phone on. And then they're like, thanks, coach. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it comes back. They they grow through that. But uh, it's definitely a challenge these days. I, I don't know how. I, I, like I said, i got twin girls who are who are 15, you know, and, and it's a challenge for dad to get them off the phone. You know, it's like so that's just the way they're communicating these days. But um, uh, one, one other quick thing. You're doing uh, a talk for ASCA, you know. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Lamont was the one who kind of connected us, which was great. And, and she's the CEO there. So uh, what's the plan out there? What do you what do you intend to do? Well, so I'm, I'm doing sort of uh, opening, not the keynote for the whole event, but opening the second day of the event. Okay. And, you know, gonna we're, we're just finalizing topics, but really around this idea of how do you go from a transactional to a transformational coach? Um, how do you create culture? Because even in the, you know on in the pool, even though in the moment that that person is swimming on their own, the the team culture, what it feels like on the pool deck, how you treat each other, determines whether you get the most out of your athletes or not. So the importance yeah. of team culture, even in individual sports, probably talk a little bit about parent engagement um because even at the you know these days college coaches are starting to deal more and more with parents um yeah and and then we'll probably introduce some of the topics from the book around you know probably a breakout on what is it you know how, what does it mean to be a great teammate so yeah. uh yeah i'm really looking forward to to that event uh, in september in in dallas good stuff well listen i appreciate you doing this today having a little chat here and uh and continue to raise awareness. I think it's these these are discussions that need to continue to happen, and the work that you're doing is is obviously great. Where can people easily find you? I mean, the mothership is definitely changing the game project dot com. You okay. can find links to the podcast there, which is called the Way of Champions podcast. Um, you can find links to all the books or Amazon or all that sort of stuff as well. So uh, yeah, that's the mothership.